I haven't done a lot of videos, but I have um, uh, been working hard as a surgeon. And really what happened with my videos when I started was I, I, I'm just I'm, I'm really not a, a huge operation. I've just got a few employees, and I um, have been providing all the aftercare for myself, um, for my patients, and, and I don't offload it to dietitians or nurses. I really do most of it myself, and I see my patient uh, patients years out um, from surgery. Um, and uh, as a result, I, I um, have kind of developed my own nutritional plan, and I've developed um, a, a, a different way of thinking about, about weight loss surgery. I wrote my book in 2013. Really, initially, it was a nutritional guide for my patients. And over time, it just kind of grew. And at some, at, after a while, I thought, wow, this actually could be a book. And the same thing is what really happened with my YouTube videos is I put out the videos for my patients um, and, uh, and just to kind of help educate them on their post-operative diet – and my web guy called me and said, you know, you've got about a thousand people who have sub subscribed to your um, to your uh, uh, to, to your weight loss channel. So I haven't been posting any videos for the last few years, really, because I've been pretty busy operating, um, and uh, and and um, I've, but I really I'm back, and I have I've put together a, a ton of new videos. Um, I've got I'm I think I'm up to about. Uh, I think we're at about we're I think I just hit over a hundred videos. So there are a hundred new videos that outline nutrition and weight loss surgery. My, I, I've mapped out about 160 videos, so I'm in the process of finishing those, and I put them all on a website. Um, it's poundofcureweightloss.com, and um, that website is going to be you're going to be able to subscribe to that and and view really a very comprehensive long term. Um, uh, uh, approach to both nutrition and also to weight loss surgery, and I've I've really kind of broken um, weight loss surgery down into uh, five stages: the planning for surgery stage, the immediate recovery stage, what I call the honeymoon phase, the end of the honeymoon phase, and then the rest of your life phase, and. I kind of break it down for each person who's in that stage and give them some advice on, on what you can do to maximize your success. There was a question I, I saw earlier about someone who'd regained some weight after a gastric bypass uh, and what you can do in that, in that scenario. Um, and the, the, the website will really have a lot of information about that. But to break that down, just to kind of answer that, the first thing you have to do is look for um, any – any potential causes of weight gain? Have you started on any medications? I'd say a third of the time I see someone come in my office who's regained weight after surgery, they've been placed on a medication that's largely responsible for the weight gain. Um, also, I've seen, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of times people don't recognize the danger of uh, uh, sugar-sweetened beverages. They cause a tremendous amount of weight gain, um, and and get eliminating those is important. And then, you know, your diet obviously can play a role as well. Um, and there's so many factors that really go into it, but the website really, I think, would, would be helpful. The website is poundofcureweightloss.com. Um, we've got a couple of videos up there for free. I will be putting a few videos um, uh, up on YouTube as well, um, but I'm, what I'm really trying to do is instead of kind of these random videos that maybe address one-off um, one questions, I'm, I, what I want to do is put together a real comprehensive program so that Anyone going through the surgery can spend, who, who's willing to put in the time to educate themselves about all of these things um, uh, that that are happening and, and what these surgeries mean, can can start from the beginning and really get to uh, have a full and comprehensive understanding of what these surgeries um, do. Uh, so someone, so so Sherry, yes, I did see it. I um, so Sherry commented that she tried to upgrade it to the bariatrics, and I refunded her money because there is the bariatric content isn't up, so there, so it it doesn't work. The the website is set up into five courses, um, and the five courses are um, on the first one is about this idea of your set point and how weight loss occurs, and anyone who is struggling with weight regain after after bariatric surgery would. Um, would would really benefit from that. Um, the second course is on the metabolic reset diet, which is for someone who really wants to get going and lose weight quickly. The third course is for um, a slow and progressive approach, which is how uh, really what I wrote about in my book. 
Um, the fourth course is on exercise, and the fifth course is meal plans and recipes. Um, and there's also a section with the videos that we're we're working on, um, and, um, and 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 that will give essentially allow you. It's more designed for the use on the phone, so you can kind of just go from one video to the next to the next to the next. I'm still kind of working out the kinks on the website. I'm I'm really just kind of looking for people who are. Uh, interested in, in checking it out. It's not very expensive. It's $9 a month for the nutrition site. And as I'm going to start, um, hopefully by the end of this week, I'm going to put the first bariatric course, which will have 40 videos about bariatric surgery up there. And I'm going to give everybody who has nutri- access to the nutrition course, to the nutrition membership, access to the um, to the bariatric um, content as well. So if you sign up now, you'll get the nutrition stuff and you'll be the first ones to get the bariatric um, memberships. Um, Oh, Sherry, it looks like your membership was canceled. If you um, uh, you can send me um, – um, if you go to the website, poundacureweightloss.com, and go to About, the About page, there's a way to send a message in, and I'll make sure I take care of everything. Um, here's another question about your surgeon saying you should only be eating four ounces um, of uh, – four ounces at each meal, which sounds unrealistic. And, and I think that's – you know, that's a um, – a little bit of an interesting question because the one thing I found about about bariatric surgery patients is that it really has to do with what you're eating, not just how much you're eating. So four ounces of yogurt should be absolutely no problem where four ounces of chicken breast, it can take you 18 months from surgery until you can get to that level of consumption. This idea that your your gastric pouch is like this vessel that just holds enough content and if you fill it up regardless of what's inside it, it's really not accurate. The food travels through the the gastric pouch within literally a minute or two of eating it Um, and it's just that different foods have different impact on um, onto your uh, um, in terms of your appetite and uh, as a result that you know chicken four ounces of chicken you could feel absolutely stuffed and be ready to vomit halfway through but four ounces of yogurt should be pretty um, simple and straightforward there's a lot of people who have some apprehension about a plant-based diet and really emphasize protein and while i think protein is important in the first three six months after surgery i typically use people's lab tests so if your lab tests show that your protein level is low then i would um i would uh, I would still emphasize a protein first approach. However, if your um, if your protein level is normal, then I really don't look at bariatric patients, even gastric bypass patients, as being that different from everybody else. And we probably eat way too much protein in this country. And this emphasis on animal protein is a big mistake. Um, it causes diabetes, high blood pressure, dementia, heart disease, and we should be eating a lot more plants. And a lot less animal protein. Now, you don't have to go all the way vegan unless that's really the direction you want to go. And and my program is what I like to think of. It's like a vegan diet with a little bit of meat in it. Um, and we see this what we call a hockey stick um, uh, change in terms of, of – the impact of animal protein on your health where the first serving or so every day is probably not that big of a deal and it's only when you get to large amounts that we start to have problems. So there's a question uh, from Debbie Barkey Wine. Hello, Dr. Weiner. Almost three years out from Ruin I, Ruin Y. Need to help get back on track and lose another 20, 30 pounds. Stalled for more than a year. 335 to 210. 5 foot 10. 6 3. 63 years old. So you went from 335 down to 210, which is absolutely remarkable. That's 125 pounds of weight loss. Um, and I think one thing that's really – that I really work with patients on – and you know, I'm not sure you're going to like this answer, Debbie, um, but it absolutely is um, – is the truth, and I think it's something that I, I, I work with my own patients to, to, to kind of figure out. So we ha- I have this access to this database that we use in Michigan um, where, we, uh, where we can access and look at our, um, uh, our results over the last 10 years, and I can essentially predict what, what's a reasonable range of weight loss for a patient. And I bet if I put your numbers in that it would be around 125 pounds of weight loss, which is excellent. Now, how do you get down another 20 or 30 pounds? The honest answer is that it's very unlikely that you ever will. And that's not what people want to hear. They want to be sold some magic pill or powder or something like that that will get them those last 20, 30 pounds. And and what ends up happening inevitably is that you – 
you end up making choices and getting off track and you put yourself in at risk for weight regain, which many times is what happened before surgery. So when I, the truth is, is about 95% of patients who undergo uh, bariatric surgery reach their lowest weight about uh, 12 to 18 months out from surgery and then never get to a weight lower than that that they're able to, to maintain. And so what I would say to you, Debbie, is you've done amazing. 125 pounds is incredible. And what really the emphasis should be on is, to, is preventing weight regain. Um, and weight regain can be caused by certain medications. It can be caused by yo-yo dieting. It can be caused by processed foods. It can be caused by sugar-sweetened beverages. It can be caused by a lot of different things. Um, so so uh, you know that really should be the emphasis. We put so much emphasis too on this 200 pound mark and, and you're so close to it, Debbie. But um, you know it's really, really important to be realistic and honest with yourself and recognize the, what the, um, what the uh, likelihood, the, the more dangerous risk is for you, which is weight regain. And our, our goal should be to develop the lifestyle that's going to keep you at 210 pounds. Um, all right, Megan. I think I know Megan. Went to a bariatric cooking retreat the weekend, and they believe in balancing macros. What's your take on that? So I don't know. First of all, is it macrobiotics or macronutrients? So macrobiotics, I'm not even really sure entirely what that is. I think oftentimes it that we kind of come up with some theory to try to rationalize, and, and sometimes people tell you, well, don't eat peppers, but eat tomatoes and things like that. And I think when you get into this kind of wishy-washy uh, pseudoscience where we're trying to somehow differentiate between peppers and tomatoes and apples and oranges and somehow there's some difference and there's some magical balance that allows you to um, – to somehow crack the code on your weight, that usually is just trying to get you to buy something um, or or um, make some some kind of difficult changes, and it doesn't really have a lot of science behind it. Now, macronutrients, meaning protein, fat, and, and carbohydrate, where we look for again this magic formula of say 35% carbohydrate, 40%. Um, uh, protein or 25% fat or whatever numbers they come up with. And there are a bunch of different um, um, rationales. You know, obviously the, the, the carbohydrate, uh, the low carbohydrate people will be pushing a very low carb consumption. Um, the low fat people pushing the low fat consumption. I, again, really don't emphasize this, I, except to say I think we eat way too much protein, but that's really because we eat primarily animal protein and, re- and don't eat a lot of beans and nuts in our diet, which is okay. So I think when you're looking at macronutrients, especially protein, is it vegetable protein like beans and nuts or is it animal protein because they're totally different. So my take on that is, you know, again, without knowing more about what was happening, those both of those look a little bit suspicious to me. Um, there's a question about carbs. Thought that carbs was the cause of dumping syndrome. How can this be avoided with pound of cure and with large amounts of veggies or fruit having carbs. Well, first of all, dumping syndrome technically is liquid sugar. It's not um, carbohydrates. You can also get it from overly sugary foods like cookies and cakes, um, but it's the liquid sugar that causes the, the biggest issue. Now, where I really see patients struggling is with fatty or greasy foods, and fatty or greasy foods can cause significant um, significant um, symptoms that are similar to dumping. And dumping syndrome is abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, cramping, and occasionally low blood pressure. So eating low, um, eating low, uh, um, avoiding the sugary liquids is really the, uh, the key, and avoiding the greasy foods is the key. But fruit and vegetables absolutely do not cause dumping syndrome, and it's not carbohydrates in general that cause mm-hmm. dumping syndrome. All right, so if you are in maintenance and not necessarily looking to lose, should you add back in whole grains? Great question. I addressed that in detail on the, in the website um, and, and the metabolic reset diet as well as in, the, in course two and course three. So the answer is yes, in general, you can. Uh, I really kind of lump carbohydrates into three categories, the colorful starchy vegetables like sweet potatoes, squash, beets, um, um, and turnips, and those you should be, feel free to add in liberally without any concern. 
Um, on the bad or the ugly side of the processed carbohydrates, that's the white bread, white pasta, white rice, and also instant oatmeal really deserves to be in that category as well. Instant oatmeal is different from quick cook oats, um, which are just kind of flatter or more pressed oatmeal. But instant oatmeal is almost always loaded with brown sugar or honey or cinnamon or you know some kind of artificial flavors and um, sweetener, uh, and it's heavily processed. That should be avoided. And then in the middle we have the um, the the whole grains like brown rice and oatmeal, and I think things like that can generally be added in with a little bit of care and concern. And I would keep a close eye on your diet, um, but. Those can be added safely back in without causing significant weight gain. I'd keep an eye on that. And also if you're exercising, they absolutely can. But I, the, on, on the poundofcureweightloss.com website, I really go into a lot of detail about um, carbohydrates and adding some flexibility to the metabolic reset diet. I've seen this uh, question. This is a great question. Angela Duval, does sleep affect the amount of weight loss? Um, absolutely, it affects the uh, amount of of weight loss, and if there's one group of people who I really struggle to um, to get to lose weight, um, either through nutritional means or through surgical means, it's people who uh, work the night shift. And there's something about disrupting your sleep wake cycle that really contributes to um, weight gain and can inhibit your ability to lose uh, to lose weight. So, without question, a good night's sleep, ideally eight hours of sleep. Um, that's uninterrupted is critical, and the big problem is um, that uh, that uh, um, some of the sleep medicines that are out there can cause significant weight gain. So be very wary of trazodone and risperidone, which are sometimes prescribed for sleep problems, um, and eliminate them as much as possible. I think Benadryl is probably the best sleep medicine that's out there. Um, and then beyond that, we're looking at uh, medications, um, um, you know, the things like Ambien and Lunesta I'm not a fan of. I'm a big fan of sleep hygiene and routine and kind of getting yourself into some, a structured uh, schedule. Uh, so Megan, Meg Whitman back about the macros talked about that's a certain per- percentage of fat, carbs and proteins. I, I, I just think that's oversimplification. Um, you know, that's like me saying, well, gastric bypass surgery is done by rerouting your intestine. Um, well, that is a true statement. It is a dramatic oversimplification. Um, this was a question from Jody. Uh, I'm going to butcher her last name, so I'm not even going to say it. But she's got some IBS symptoms. And now IBS is, is, a, is a tricky um, tricky game because there's so many factors that play into IBS. Um, the first is that oftentimes it is related to something you're eating. The, co- the most common culprits are artificial sweeteners, um, dairy, um, and wheat or gluten. And I would work initially to adjust your diet before I started to, um, I, to, to really make any um, other changes because those are three things that we really want to get out of your diet anyway. So, um, so I'd start there. Now, I do have some patients who really struggle with fruits, veggies, and beans. And that can be real. That can be a very difficult thing, I think, making sure you're exercising, getting enough sleep, seeing if you can identify if there are some fruits or some beans or some vegetables that you can tolerate well, then I would, um, I would, I would look at, at, at those. Um, uh, Sherry asked about, can the pouch be stretched or is it... The anastomosis that stretches allowing us to eat more. So I've got a video on YouTube about that, about how to prevent your stomach from stretching. And it's really kind of a bait and switch because the, the, the punchline of it is it's that your stomach doesn't stretch. The opening does stretch. It stretches for every single person. We've never been able to demonstrate that a, someone with a large opening is going to lose less weight than someone with a small opening. And there's, there's no question to, in my mind that this is not the mechanism of weight regain. It's not the mechanism of an increase appetite. I think it's a return to old habits, a return to old food addiction. I also think it's a natural consequence of the surgery. Everybody over time is able to eat more. And this moment when you kind of figure out that you can eat a lot more and that you may not have the appetite control is what I call the end of the honeymoon phase after surgery. And it's usually somewhere between 18 months to about two and a half, three years out from surgery. We see it a little earlier after the sleeve than we do after a gastric bypass. 
And it's that time when you start to lose a little bit of control over your appetite and all of a sudden these favorable changes that you had after surgery are starting to disappear and you may even be seeing a few pounds come back on Um, and all of a sudden your weight is a struggle again. And this is a natural phase in the life of every weight loss surgery patient. I haven't made these videos yet. I'm hoping to in the next month or so and have them up ideally by the end of the summer. But I've got a a, a lot of advice about how you can set yourself up to get through this initial honeymoon phase and and so that you are really in good shape at the end of the honeymoon. All right, so some other questions. We are 75% Melanie Evans and Williams. We're 75% plant-based, struggling to get that 100%, working on it. Keep it up. That's great. All right, what else do we got here? All right. Lots of thumbs up. I love your book. Back to sleep. All right. I'm new to this Facebook thing. It's not quite natural to me. How does a sleeve patient get these veggies in when you only eat half a cup at each meal? Four months post-op. That's from Melanie um, Evanson-Williams. So Melanie, that's a great question and certainly something that a lot of my patients and I discuss in the office. Uh, And the idea is is that you know at four months post-op, you're going to be limited um, in terms of the amount you can eat. And the idea is that we want to get you up to a pound of veggies. And this is really kind of where you – this idea of this honeymoon transitioning to the end of the honeymoon um, um, uh, takes place. The idea is that if you um, start – with whatever veggies you can eat and you um, – with every passing month as you're able to eat more and more, you add a little bit more of the veggies in with your goal being to kind of transition from the protein first approach that we typically take in the first three months or so. And especially with sleeve patients, I really work to get them to, to a veggie first approach within the next – within the first – you know, three to six months after surgery. So the idea is, no, you're not going to get in a pound of veggies at four months post-op. That's just not going to happen. Um, but you might be able to get in a quarter pound or a third of a pound. And, and at month six, you might be up to a half of a pound. And really, by about a year out from surgery, I bet you can get a pound in. And this kind of keeps you eating a reasonable amount. And it also keeps you from freaking out when you start to be able to eat more, which is, again, this is how what happens after these surgeries. It's not something special or unique or some sign of imminent failure for you. It's the natural consequence of recovery from these surgeries. It's a long, uh, long recovery. Um, so I think when I get patients to focus on this increased ability to eat, allowing them to eat more vegetables, which is, of course, going to help them come up with a stable and, and um, long-term uh, eating plan, then it, it makes a lot of sense. So Han Milosevsky says, not everyone suffers dumping syndrome. You are absolutely right. In fact, it's a relative minority of people who suffer dumping syndrome. Um, so the, and, and also over time, dumping symptoms decrease substantially. I would estimate that at like five years out after surgery, only around 10% of people suffer from significant dumping syndrome. Um, can you still lose weight after the honeymoon period from and and Dina Robles? Well, and Dina, I you know in in general, my answer to that is no. Um, there are some exceptions to that. I don't want you to kind of think that that all hope is lost, but this really gets back to the four ways that you can lower your set point. And the truth is, once you hit that lowest weight with with uh, after surgery then that really is the maximal effect of surgery. And it it does become quite difficult to lose additional weight. So what I... um what I generally counsel patients on is when we look at their weight loss curve and we see it where they are at a year or two out, that wherever they are, that's kind of the lowest that they're going to be. Um, and, and we really should target our efforts toward maintaining that weight. I think the one exception would be someone who is able to start a really, really rigorous exercise program. And I, we, I have a course on that on the new, on the new website. Um, and, 
it, it talks and we're really talking about a high fitness level where we're getting your heart rate up to the to absolute max um, and um, are, are really seeing substantial um, increase in the amount of skeletal muscle that you have. You're building muscle, not just burning calories on the treadmill, but building muscle. Um, then you could potentially lose some weight, some additional weight. Any advice for us night shift workers that don't get adequate and consistent sleep? From Indina Robles. Well, Indina, first you have my sympathies, uh, and this is something that's really, really difficult. Uh, and a lot of times, it's what works for your family, um, or for your lifestyle, or it's just a, you know a really good job, and, and so you're you're not willing to kind of try to switch off the night shifts. I understand that we have to kind of live our lives the best we can. Um, but so the first thing I would say is. At least try to be consistent. I think probably the worst thing you can do is say work the night, you know, sleep the night shift um, on the weekend, um, or you know, three days a week you're sleeping the you're you're up all night, and then four days a week you're kind of live a normal uh, sleep wake sc- schedule like the rest of us. That's something you absolutely should try to avoid and try to be consistent. So if you're working the night shift, you should try to stick to that schedule as much as possible. That's about all I've got. And, and also, I think to, to be patient with yourself and to recognize that there are factors beyond your control that are interfering with your, your weight loss. Margie Callahan, do you, Margie Callahan, do you think it's possible to lose 100 pounds without surgery? I'm 65, weigh 300 pounds. I'm no longer responsible for anybody but myself, and I would like to enjoy however many years I have left. My mother lived to be 85 before she became sick, and I hope to have at least 20 healthy more years. So do I think it's possible? Absolutely, it is possible. Um, But I think it's perhaps not under as much of your own control as you would think. There is absolutely some genetics to how much weight we're able to lose. And also, there would I would need to know a lot more about the medications you're taking, the medical diseases you have, your mobility status. If you have limited mobility, it becomes very difficult. What your what your baseline diet is? If your diet is kind of primarily fast food and is heavily processed, then I think you're going to have a much better chance of losing weight without surgery than if you actually eat a pretty good diet. Um, just because when you change over to something like my program, where you're eating pre- predominantly plants and a super healthy diet, then um, then then you're making a huge change if you're coming from a processed diet, and therefore we can see some big results. If you're making a just a relatively small change, you already eat pretty well, you clean it up a little bit more, it's unlikely to, to lose 100 pounds just by cleaning your diet up a little bit more. So, you know, it's a difficult question to answer without knowing a lot more, but certainly I think um, that it, uh, it is possible, but the odds are against you in all honesty. And, and I think if... if um, I would give this absolutely your best shot, but I'd also really strongly consider weight loss surgery, especially a sleeve in in someone at at your age, I think would be a reasonable option. And with our, with our safety profile and that surgery, that could be a huge help. Um, uh, Some nice comments from some people. Thank you very much. All right, we've got time for a few more questions and then we'll wrap it up. I've got some work to do on the technology um, for sure. And I've got big plans for what we can do with Facebook Live. Um, but I think I need a much faster computer and perhaps a better network connection to do it. Um, so we may have to kind of stick to the phone, which actually I think worked out pretty pretty well. Um, um, but I've, I, I would like to kind of get things a little more sophisticated um, and be able to really make some 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 um, uh, some good t- uh, so use the technology a little bit more effectively. All right. So with last question. So can a bariatric patient follow your plan and the uh, the food map or FODMAP to eliminate IBS? So the FODMAP diet is a diet that people follow to try to eliminate IBS. I, you know, can you? You absolutely can. Um, but it becomes increasingly difficult. So what happens is eventually there become too many rules and it becomes too hard for any reasonable human being to stick to that program. So, you know, I, what I would say, Jody, is perhaps you want to either try my program or try the FODMAP program 
Um, but try, but uh, trying to mix and match them may get a little confusing and also be extremely difficult. And one thing that is really very, really hard is to if, when there are too many rules and we make this too hard, you're going to fail. And we don't want to set you up for failure. We want to set you up for success. So I'd say try mine, try the pound of cure, try the FODMAP, but but um, I would try to avoid doing them both at the same time. Uh, on uh, Milosevsky. I'm looking at getting a Ruin Y in September. I'm a diabetic and was worried when my blood, um, when my blood in high, I get very thirsty. When it, what if I'm very thirsty after surgery? Can I still get water down? My doctor said yes. Typically you can, but more importantly, the reason that you're very thirsty is because you're having high blood sugar and you're passing glucose through your urine. So if you have this surgery, it's going to generally put your diabetes into remission. You'll have normal blood sugars and you won't be as thirsty anymore. You will have normal blood sugars within 36 hours of surgery most likely. Again, need to know a lot more before I can make some type of promise like that. But but that is not going to be a major issue. And if anything, it's a reason why you really should move forward with surgery. Melanie Evanson, William, can we get our protein through plants? I don't do protein drinks or powders. Good. I hate protein shakes as well. I try to get my patients off of them. Uh, I have my own recipes for kind of a yogurt and nut-based smoothie that has about 25 to 30 grams of protein and, um, and really works out well for patients. So absolutely, you can do it through plants. Some of those plant-based um, protein powders, some pea protein. I tried one of those shakes. I had one of these reps come in and, and – and, um, uh, gave me one of these shakes and it was probably the most disgusting thing I've ever drank in my life. Um, so I'd be real wary of like the pea protein shakes. Um, so, um, yeah, but so can you do it? Absolutely. You can do it. Beans also are probably one of the easiest foods to keep down after weight loss surgery. You can do it within a week or so of surgery, probably 10 days, 14 days is when I have patients do it. Um, and, uh, and and would real and was really great. I see a question from Leslie. I would love it if you could take time to answer my question already submitted. Um, not many resources for people like me who already had surgery and were already on an exercise program. I don't see your. I'm looking at the screen. I don't see if it's possible to kind of re redo it or if my assistant can kind of text it to me. I'd be happy to answer it. But without seeing it again, I'm really. I got to work on my Facebook Live. I think. I've got some improvement that I've got to, I've got to do. I, I need to ask my daughters. Hi. All right. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. Hopefully, it's we're putting it back down. Susan Kuldis, love your book. And after listening to your last comment about the lady wanting to lose 100 pounds, I fear I should not have dropped out of my bariatric surgery clinic program. I was too frightened of having terrible gas and dumping syndrome. Well, the dumping syndrome is something that's pretty uncommon um, in terms of it being a real lifestyle uh, uh, limiting issue. The gas, I, I certainly have some patients who struggle a little bit with gas, um, but it tends not to be all that that terrible. Um, all right, so Leslie, I had the sleeve, Leslie, I had the sleeve surgery on 511 and was a competitive rower. I plan to get back to it six weeks post-op. Awesome, Leslie. A high-intensity exercise program like competitive rowing is absolutely great. I have a number of patients who are really good athletes. People think you can't be a good athlete and be overweight. Absolutely not. Um, you you can, and um, and I would encourage you to get back to it six weeks post-op. Uh, I think that seems like a pretty reasonable um, length of time. My general rule, though, is within 90 days, um, I don't answer – I don't – don't take my advice. Take your own surgeon's advice. So I don't know what happened in the operating room. I don't know if they repaired a hiatal hernia. I don't know if it was a tenuous repair or anything like that, which may have – may um, mean that they want to push the uh, – they want to – they don't want you to, to do this competitive rowing. So make sure you clear that with your surgeon. Uh, Leslie, um, don't just take my word for it. But personally, my patient, without any other complicating factors, that would be reasonable. Um, this is going to be the final question. Angela Duval, um, nine months out, installed for a month. Can I lose more? I hope so. It depends a lot on how much weight you've lost, on um, 
on other factors as well, you know, always kind of limiting. It's always difficult to answer some of these questions when um, you don't have all the information. But I think all hope is not lost at nine months, but it is, certainly is coming to the stage at which the, the weight loss starts to slow down a little bit. So um, I would, uh, uh, you know, I need to know more. I also, that it is a time when I use weight loss medications in my um, office. Um, and it may be time to start to experiment a little bit with some weight loss medications, your bariatric surgeon or their, the, the program that you're um, part of um, what, uh, may, may, um, may be helpful. Um, last question about um, um, someone who's regaining some weight, Re Renee Katrina was regaining some weight, um, uh, Highest was 240, lost 92 pounds. That's a remarkable weight loss, especially after a sleeve. But she started to regain some at about three years post-op. Her metabolism hates her, and she gains if she hits 1,200 calories. The first thing I would do with you, <clears throat> Renee, if you were my patient, is I'd get you on the metabolic reset diet. It's in my book. Um, it's also – I have a, a, a new website. It's called a apoundofcureweightloss.com. Um, it's poundofcureweightloss.com, and uh, I have a course on that. It's course two, and it will go over the metabolic reset diet with the meal plans and the recipes and everything you would need. But that would be my first start. Um, rather than focusing on calories, I'd focus on the quality of your food, um, and I'd get started on the nutrition, uh, and then start looking at some exercise options, um, and finally. Um, uh, potentially some medications, especially 22 pounds of weight regain. Um, we should be able to get you back down or close to that and then really establish a solid program for maintaining that weight um, loss. Um, thank you so much, Sherry. It looks like you sent me a note. I'm going to get um, uh, and take care of getting you reactivated and fix all of that. I appreciate you uh, your eagerness to get on the bariatric content. And I promise as soon as it's up, I'm going to put it up there. And anyone who's logged in as a nutrition member is going to be able to see the bariatric content as it's produced. Um, and uh, feel free to also comment in the forums. I'm going to moderate the forums and I'm happy to kind of address questions there. Thank you everybody for logging in. This was really a lot of fun. I promise I'm going to work on the technology and get even better. Um, it may take me a little bit of time to get there, but we will get there and we'll continue to do these. Um, so again, thanks for uh, logging in and we will talk to you soon or see you online soon. Um, take care.